Welcome into episode 233 of the Sources Say Podcast, your go-to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the growing KSR Podcast Network. Sources Say is, as always, presented by our good friends at Justice Dental. Visit one of their two Lexington locations on Blazer Parkway in Wellington Way by scheduling an appointment online at justicedental.com or by calling 859-543-0700. You can even send a text message to one of their friendly team members at the same number to ask a question or make an appointment. Uh, Now is a great time to schedule your dental cleaning. Dr. Thompson, Dr. Justice, and their team strive to provide you with good oral health and a comfortable environment. The Justice Dental team looks forward to seeing you soon. I am your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Very happy to be joined once again by Sean Smith of Go Big Blue Country for a late night, uh, I guess, pregame edition. I kind of a, a let the thoughts marinate a little bit following the Vandy win down in in Nashville. But now all sights are on the big one. Kansas is coming to Rupp Arena. Sean, first off, how the heck are you? And second off, how are you feeling going into uh, today's big matchup? Um, fantastic. I've uh, been on the road scouting a little bit because we move into region tournament tomorrow but I feel okay I feel good about this Uh, when we talked three weeks ago on this podcast and I talked to that we would evaluate after Tennessee and I said the next big evaluation is Kansas I didn't think that these two teams would flip positions Kentucky was kind of reeling there in early January and really the entire season and then got that big win at Knoxville and then has been playing better as of late and played a very, very clean game against Vandy Tuesday night in Nashville. I thought that that was a big step in the right direction as well, given the momentum that they've had, because it was a game where you could catch maybe Kentucky overlooking Vandy and getting to Kansas yeah. on Saturday, but I thought yeah. that was a big deal. So now it's it's a little different. Kentucky's in the spot that I didn't think they'd be in this game, and Kansas in the spot that I didn't think they'd be in. Kansas needs this win the same way Kentucky needed the win in Knoxville to kind of spark something, get them right. Uh, So I didn't see that that, I don't think I saw that narrative kind of being there maybe two and a half, three weeks ago, but look, this is a huge opportunity for Kentucky to get another quad one win and to end January and go into and start moving into February uh, with a little bit of resume building. Remember I I told you that this could have been a team we could have looked up at the end of January and it wouldn't shock me if they had nine or 10 losses. Well, here they sit, they're on a little bit of a win streak, Kansas on a losing streak. I didn't see that coming, but this is a huge game for both teams. Are we at the point yet? Because I, I remember, I can't. I think it was the Gonzaga loss, maybe, or it was either the second or third loss. Um, I, I remember I was. It was my stupid podcast in the airport. I think it was coming back from Gonzaga, where uh, we said, "All right, well, they lost all of the early season, you, you know, opportunities, and then obviously." Uh, you, you know, things kind of went south a, a couple, just a couple weeks later. UCLA, um, you know, South Carolina, the wheels kind of fall off. Missouri, just uh, it, so many letdowns. But uh, they they kind of lost that the the chance to you know kind of have some screw ups later later on down the road because of their losses early. Have we gotten to the point now that we have we've gotten over the early season screw ups? And now you can you can afford a loss. Are we at that point yet, or are we still kind of in that must win territory, or kind of in the in between? The reason I call this one must win is I think it gets them firmly off the bubble. I think that's why I give it must win. If you don't get it, then you've got to go get it somewhere else, right? Yeah. But if you can get this one on your home court, then I think it gives them some wiggle room there. Because tell me two teams that would have two better wins in the month of January. Then on the road in Knoxville, and then you beat a Kansas team who's still going to – I mean, they're going to fare well when it comes to Selection Sunday. You know that the team's going to get it right at some point. That's a talented team with talented players that was one of the better teams in college basketball in the early part of the schedule. Uh, So I think that getting this one kind of lets them have some breathing room when it comes to – right now I think Joe Lenardi has them as an 11 seed, I believe, is in right there on the the cusp of still being a bubble team. So you don't want to stay in that territory. You've done enough now to get yourself back in the conversation. You get this win, maybe you break back into the top 25, maybe you start creeping in a little bit, and then you take February and build on that. If you lose it, then I think you got to get some of those other ones down the stretch. But we know that there's road trips to Arkansas coming up. We know Tennessee is going to be a hungry team coming to Rupp Arena here in a few weeks. Like you, you want to take care of this one 
to kind of give yourself some of that room that you're talking about to where you can kind of be like, okay, have we done enough now that we don't have to necessarily feel so crunched when it comes to playing our way off the bubble? Because look, it's been a month since that loss to Missouri. And I thought that was the moment where I thought Kentucky was going to be a bubble team. And then they had the blowout loss at Alabama, I think a week later. That feels like forever ago. Kentucky needs a win against Kansas at Rupp Arena to have another big time win on its resume. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I think that's why it's a must win. Not, you know, not even because of how things went earlier on or, uh, you know, how things are even, you know, midway through the year, or this, the, the, the resume they're starting to build or things like that. I just think just from a momentum standpoint, things have been going so well, you know, second half against Texas A&M, second half against Georgia, and now the full 40 minutes, not 40 minutes, but 36 minutes of very strong play at Vandy for the first time, you can kind of go back to that preseason expectation you had of this team and, and see that vision again. You can kind of, you know, take a step back and go, okay, so the things that we loved about this team in the Bahamas, the things that we loved about them on paper, you start to see that vision. We The, the frustration has been because we had seen – you know, Jacob Toppin explode individually. You've seen Oscar Sheboy be Oscar Sheboy. We've seen, you know, Antonio Reeves go off. We've seen CJ Frederick hit shots. We've seen Casey Wallace, you know, come up in the clutch and do big things, but we've never seen them put it all together uh, in one cohesive, you know, 40 minute game. And I think the closest thing that we've gotten to that is, is that trip down to Vandy. And, and, I, and that's why I see this as a must win, or at least a game where you put together a a strong 40 minutes of basketball where you can even, you know, win or loss. If it's a 85, 84 final and a last second buzzer beater by, you know, something like that, you can at least go, all right, we're at least still tracking. We're still, still at least trending in that direction where you're, you're stacking solid performances on, on, on top of solid performances. It's going to be a close game. I do think it's going to be a close game. I think Kentucky's going to have to execute and do some things down the stretch in a tight game at home, and at home helps. I think the energy in that building tomorrow night is going to be the best that we've seen it all season, given the moment, the platform, and Kentucky's playing better in the last couple of weeks. So you see a team that's starting to build some confidence, but I feel like this is the one that makes people actually believe that it's real. If they can follow up the success that they've had and then go beat Kansas, and I know Kansas is a team that's coming in here struggling right now, but it's still Kansas. It's still the the winningest program in college basketball since they took over from Kentucky. So, you know, Kentucky wants to get a win and, and close that gap. But this is a game where I think Kentucky's playing to solidify itself in its mind that it has turned the corner. Yeah. Like beating Texas A&M, beating Georgia, beating Vandy, sure, you're winning games that a month ago I actually thought they would have lost a couple of these the way they were playing. It's still not really setting your mindset and changing it and thinking, okay, we are who we were wanting to be when the season started. Beating Kansas, regardless of what losing streak they're on, does that. It's the same way as beating Kentucky for some of these other schools. It kind of justifies and solidifies how you feel about yourself. And I think to close the month, we, we talked about those two trips, the game in Knoxville and this one, as those quad one games that Kentucky didn't have on its resume. And I was kind of thinking, okay, God, just get the one against Kansas at Rupp because I don't think they're winning in Knoxville. Then they go do what they did down there. Right now, I would pick Kentucky to win the game tomorrow night, given the momentum that they've had. And it just feels like that this is a team that's going to attack that game tomorrow night. I think Kentucky needs to attack it as an NCAA tournament game. Mm -hmm. It's a must-win game because it it propels you moving forward into the month of February. You're starting to get into a better spot in league standings. You're starting to kind of climb that ladder a little bit. You've improved significantly there. I mean, this was a one-in-three team in the league just a few weeks ago. Now they're starting, they're on the, the north side of 500 and they're starting to build something. I think that this is a massive opportunity. I think the, a lot of guys have to play well. Uh, it's a national spotlight game for a guy like Oscar Shibway, who has been playing better and kind of getting back to that form that, that we saw. Uh, it, it's just a massive opportunity for Kentucky to close the month of January and, and go into February with a lot of momentum. Yeah, you know, Tennessee – that was a game Kentucky had to win because that was the wheels are going to fall off completely. Like this season is over if we don't get things. Dying through. Had they lost that game. That was the, okay, do or die. We just gotta, we just gotta survive. 
This game is the okay, we can beat anybody in the country game. That that's I don't, I don't think it's do or die tomorrow night, but I think you need to play like it is. Because there's there's just I mean, you're running out of quad one opportunities. So you're you're now you're talking get off the bubble, but you're also talking build a resume and improve your seating. Mm-hmm. Like a couple of weeks ago, Jack, we we had a team that wasn't projected into the field. And then they started getting some things right. But there wasn't – these wins the last couple of weeks, though they haven't really done a whole lot to kind of take Kentucky out of that spot. It's got them right there on the cusp of it. This one gets them entirely off the bubble, in my opinion, and gives them some room to lose a game at Arkansas or if Tennessee comes into rough or something like that happens. Because uh, that's going to happen at some point. They're going to lose another quad one game to someone, maybe more than one. I think getting this one at home kind of just gives you a little bit of breathing room to the point that you don't have to kind of feel crunched when it comes to late February and you're on the road at Arkansas before the league tournament starts and going, we got to have this one. That way we're not trying to play our way in in Nashville. I'm hoping they see blood in the water with this game. I I hope they don't see this as what I think some national analysts are seeing as, oh, Kansas is playing desperate. They've lost three straight. You know, they're in this this un, this unbelievable run of like seven of their eight games in this stretch are against ranked opponents. And Kentucky is the only uh, unranked team. And it, it's hardly the easy competition against, you know, going to Rupp Arena, playing against a Blue Blood program that's playing its best basketball of the season. And that, that's technically the easiest quote unquote game of that stretch. So I hope this team sees that as blood in the water of this is a team that has – this is a Kansas team that has flaws. This is not your typical Bill Self, you know, coach team where you have this, you know, anchoring, lumbering big man down low that, you know, kind of that that perfect complimentary piece going against Oscar Sheebway where that would be kind of an issue and you got to kind of rely on guard play to win out. And, you, you know, this is not this game. Kentucky is a very significant advantage down low with Oscar Sheboy. This is a game that he should be able to eat, especially on the offensive end. He's going to be guarding an athletic forward and KJ Adams. And, and, and that's going to be a struggle. He can't get into foul trouble early, but offensively he should be able to eat deep on the defensive glass and offensive glass. He should be able to eat. Uh, all eyes are on Oscar Sheboy. You know, my time watching Kansas, I've seen them several times this year. You know, they're not tough inside. They're, you know, kind of soft in that interior. There are a lot of holes uh, that that this Kentucky team should be able to take advantage of, uh, you know, all, all eyes are on, you know, Grady Dick and, you know, that he's this, yeah. you know, unbelievable freshman talent and, and their guard, their wings are very, very good. Uh, but, but man, you know, Jalen Wilson, obviously is also a, a stellar player as well, but I really think that this team uh, sh- should see this Kansas team as one that has flaws and one they can take advantage of at home. I agree. I agree, and I think that's the mindset that Kentucky needs to go into it with. Like you said, blood in the water, and and that's I think that's the approach that Kentucky's kind of been taking for itself. It it, it found a chip and it's been playing with it. And John Calipari settled on a rotation. You have a lot of feel good stuff going right now. C.J. Frederick is really finding a rhythm. You have Savir Wheeler who had a moment there in Nashville and stepped up and, and came up huge for this team. And then you, you have guys kind of carving out roles and and this is where you want to start to kind of make your, your climb back to the top, right? Like Kentucky peaked very early. I thought last year, I thought that they peaked late December through that first week of February. And then they started doing this again around this game really last year. This team hasn't peaked yet. Yeah, well, like I mean, they're, they, still, they're, they're barely getting off the ground right now. Exactly, and that's why I'm okay with it. Like, just if you start peaking late or mid-February, I think that's where you want to start peaking. A veteran team like Kentucky with so many guys that have played uh, and, and Savir and, and Oscar and Jacob and all these guys that have this experience, and then you got these freshmen who just continue to get better. I think peaking around the Tennessee game at Rupp here in a couple of weeks is where you want to really peak. But you still want to play well enough to beat a Kansas team at Rupp Arena who is struggling right now. But, you, I mean, if Kentucky comes out and plays out of its mind tomorrow night and wins by 15 to 20, I mean, everybody's going to feel good about it. Mm-hmm. But just find a way to win and just keep getting better, keep improving, and then start peaking here in about two weeks. That's where you want to make your run to where you start becoming who you are. And, and I think Kentucky's starting to find its identity. And I think guys individually are starting to find their identity as well. And I think you're getting a team that's becoming more comfortable. I think you're getting a head coach that's 
kind of found found some success and found some things that he wants to do with this team. And uh, you you have some you had some pieces that had to shuffle its way out. Savir had to accept a different role, and uh, I think some guys are really starting to uh, kind of get comfortable in spots. And I think that's why you're seeing Kentucky have the success that's having. I mean, it's not blowing anyone out. I mean, they're still having to compete and and do some things and execute to win these games, but they're winning. That's something that they weren't doing three to four weeks ago. Like, the, give them credit. They, they've turned a corner here. Whether it's for real or whether it's not, we'll find out pretty soon. But they got to build on that stretch tomorrow night. Uh, is it great? So you bring up Savier's name a couple times, and you know, obviously, he's the most polarizing figure on this team. He's been the biggest point of conversation and controversy, and how he's used, when he's used, how often he's used. Uh, just uh, it's been the Savier, it's been the Savier Wheeler debate. Is it crazy, Sean, to think that I think he might end up being maybe the the key to the game? for Kentucky against Kansas. So my, my, the reason why I say that is Dewan Harris, uh, Kansas starting point guard is almost kind of a, their version of Savvy Wheeler, a, a high turnover, high assist guy, high usage guy, high, you know, minute guy who has been unfortunately slumping a little bit and has not been playing very good basketball as of late. Um, I think against Baylor, 37 minutes. He had two points on one of five shooting, four assists, and four turnovers. I mean, he was really, really bad uh, against Baylor. So the way I see these matchups working out, Casey Wallace, I think, is going to be you know put to the test against uh, Grady Dick. I think that's a good matchup head to head for for those two. I think uh, Jacob Toppin is going to be guarding uh, uh, Wilson, and I think. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, Oscar is probably going to have to go heads up against KJ Adams, but I, I think that matchup, you're, you, the 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 key matchup, is going to be if you can take advantage of that Dewan Harris matchup. I think Kentucky can take advantage of of him in particular, and I don't know why, but it just feels like Savir is that guy right now. Of of all times, maybe not two weeks from now, maybe not two weeks ago, but it just feels like right now we could be. Tomorrow night at 11 o'clock going, man, Savir was the reason that we won this one because he thoroughly outmatched Dewan Harris. Maybe I'm crazy, but just want to get your thoughts on that. No, I don't I don't think that's crazy at all. I, I think if Savir, the approach tomorrow night from Kentucky and Savir should be to push the pace, set the tone defensively, play with energy, and, and kind of uh, be that spark plug. I think that would be the perfect role for him on this team from now all the way through the NCAA tournament to the end of the season. It's kind of be that change of pace guy that gives you a burst when he comes in the game and when he's in there, even if it's just for a three- or four-minute spurt here and there that kind of changes the tempo, uh, gets these shooters like Antonio Reeves and C.J. Frederick some looks downhill in transition and get Oscar rim running and things like that. I, I, I do agree with that. I think that when you look at matchups, he does have the advantage there. And you're talking about an experienced piece who – has played some really good games at Kentucky. And I could see this being another – Kansas. Yeah, I could see this being another one of those games for him. He did build some confidence in Nashville. Uh, I thought the things that he said as of late have been very mature. Very much. And, and that's a very good sign because it's not easy to do what Savir's done in college basketball and in a place like Kentucky and then kind of have it not really ripped from you but feel it kind of slipping away from you. I think it takes a lot to to bounce back and accept that role, but to realize that they were winning those games without him, and now it's either you want to be a part of this or you don't, and if you do, we're better, and if you don't, we're fine. So I think that that was a big step for him. I thought that that was a big step for maturity, and uh, I think Kentucky is going – I think you're going to get a good version of him tomorrow night. I think he's kind of settled into his role. Yeah. Yeah, I, I... – for for some reason, you know, I feel like the the wings are going to be a wash. I feel like, you know, the, the two stars of the, Kansas is just a very top heavy team, and I think that's what makes me feel feel really good about the matchup. They don't have the depth. Uh, they, you know, I, Kansas is two stars. They're going to get their points. They're going to get their their highlight plays, and they're going to you know push the pace and and really you know kind of set the tone on that end. But beyond beyond you know those two in particular. 
there are a lot of mismatches to be had and, and, you know, their bench is just really weak. They're, they're still dealing with some injuries at the bottom of the rotation, but, you know, bottom of the bench as well. So they just don't have, you know, many of those plug and play pieces at that, you know, seven, eight, nine spot, their top five is solid. But once you start getting to the bulk of their depth, that's where you can really start finding, you know, key mismatches. And that's why tomorrow could be a good, uh, you know, a big opportunity for guys, you know, like Xavier Wheeler, if, if you you're running with the same starting lineup of case and, you know, if you want to put Chris at the three, whatever, I, you know, I'd prefer him at the four and that's a whole different conversation, but uh, you know, you want the bulk of the minutes to be the main basketball Benny five, but man, I, I think Xavier is as that six and even, you know, Chris Livingston is a seven or even a Lance Ware at an eight. I just think that there, there are some mismatches to be had. We, we said this recently Kentucky needs Savir Wheeler and Casey Wallace both. Mm-hmm. They need them both at the same time, and they need them both at different times. And I think having that luxury of having a guy like Savir who has a ton of experience in college basketball, in big games like this against Kansas, against the Blue Blood programs, I think that's going to fare well for Kentucky. And I like the change of pace of the two. I like what Kaysen can do with the ball in his hands. If Kentucky wants to to ground out and do some things and get downhill and and get a better offensive threat. And I also like that Xavier can go in the game and be that spark plug that picks you up 94 feet and kind of changes the pace and flow of the game. Like fresh legs at guard, that's nice to have. We've seen Kentucky get thin at those spots, mm-hmm. especially last year with injuries. Right now I feel like they got a collection of guys on the perimeter that are playing well. And, and that's a good thing. Like, no one's really, like, being – I mean, Kaysen's done his thing. But, like, you don't have guys that are just going, like, crazy every single game. It's been a consistent thing. Like, it's Antonio Reeves one game or C.J. Frederick gets big shots a game. Sabir had his moment in Nashville. I think that's what you kind of want because you don't want to get caught up to where it's one guy has to kind of be the guy every single time. And if they don't play well, then Kentucky doesn't play well. I mean, we saw Kentucky go on the road and beat Tennessee, and Kaysen Wallace wasn't really even 100%, and Savir didn't play. Somebody else had to step up in that moment. Well, it's it's somebody else's turn on I. And I think that that's, that's the thing that I'm starting to like about this team is they're getting consistent in who they are, but you also have guys that are having individual moments. You had Oscar Sheboy go bonkers against Georgia. Then you've had Antonio Reeves step up and, and have his games. You've had Savir have his moments. That's the teams that when Kentucky's teams under Cal are playing at their best, it's multiple guys having moments in a stretch of good play, and you're starting to see that now. Yeah, I I, I, I completely agree. And, I, I you know, looking at the box score, uh, 22 minutes for Savir in, in Nashville. And he was kind of the story of that game just because of the spark that he, that he brought. And that's been my argument in just various platforms is that was Davion Mintz last season. You know, Davion had a handful of 30 plus minute games, but he was the guy that came in and would give you 20 to 25 minutes. He'd knock a couple shots down. He'd dunk on somebody's head. He'd do, you know, have a crazy pin block on the on the backboard or whatever. That's that's what Davion Mintz brought to this team. And he was beloved. Everybody loved Davion Mintz. There wasn't a single person that looked at Davion and was like, oh yeah, that guy sucks. Or, you know, like he was a guy that everybody rallied behind because he embraced his role. He accepted his role. And and that's just kind of been my frustration with the whole Savier dynamic is he is such a likable kid he's such a big personality uh, you know the way he plays you know he's a smaller kid you know that that on paper is a fan favorite everybody loves a Savir Wheeler and I think people have gotten just so caught up in how he's used and the number of minutes that he's been getting and things like that that it's kind of taken away from that shine that you know what what people fell in love with Savir to begin with and I think that's why why people loved his 22 minute 4.5 assist game in Nashville. He wasn't anything special, but he just played his role and he played it damn well. And I think that's, that's he what added, they need for him. He, he added value in his time on the floor. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't take away, he added value. And I thought that that was a big thing. If, I mean, look, you're talking about a guy, you know, six assists on average and he got five, 22 minutes. Like, if you can play him in spurts, I think he's better in short spurts. 
you don't want to be running him into the ground and playing. Like there were times last year he had to play 35, 36 minutes a night. Like, and that's probably going to grind down on a guy, especially if it's having to run the play. So if you can get 21, 22 minutes from him and then Kaysen gets his time and you play them both together at times, you play them opposite at times, and I think it makes Kentucky a better version of itself. Is finding that balance within those two at that spot and then just having options, two entirely different players. And one night you may need Savir to do a little more what he does on another night. And then you need Kaysen to do his thing in a different role. Like that's why you play 31 regular season games. It, it, it's a it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And you're trying to just figure it out in enough time to get it figured out to where you're not putting yourself in a bad spot. And then unfortunately for Kentucky, it started to figure it out at a time where it's not too late. Had they started to make this run, let's say two weeks from now, then you're kind of getting in that desperation mode where one loss could break you. They're not at that point yet, but I think a win gets them off that point entirely. You just can't go lose to another team like you did against South Carolina. Mm -hmm. If that loss wasn't on the, the board right now, you're probably not talking about a team that's an 11 seed projected. You're probably talking about a team that's an eight seed. Yeah. projected. I don't think that loss was that significant and that damaging at the time that you need something now to kind of negate it. And another quad one win against a team like Kansas kind of wipes that one out. Right now, South Carolina and Tennessee is kind of wiping themselves out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, it, it just kind of cancels out. You need to get something else on that resume that kind of gets you back in that category. And I think tomorrow night's the perfect opportunity. And then there's plenty of opportunities in February. Tennessee, Arkansas, all these quad one games coming up that Kentucky can then start building its resume. Right now, it's just trying to lay the foundation for it. Got an interesting question for you as we kind of start winding things down here. Uh, a lot of talk this week from John Calipari, and we heard from Chin Coleman. He had similar thoughts, you know, the players as well about, you know, playing, you know, buying into their role and, and being an all-star in their individual roles. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of talk about positions and how players are used and, you know, who's getting minutes and how they're getting the minutes and things like that. Uh, it's just been a big controversial topic here in recent weeks. But that's clearly been a point of emphasis with John Calipari, you know, the the being an all-star in your role. Uh, Chin Coleman said that we we don't need everybody to be great. We don't need any individual person to go out there and be Oscar Sheebway 37 and 24 on any given night. We just need everybody to be good and embrace their role to be a special team, to, to get to that end destination. If you could give me three players on this team and what their specific roles need to be moving forward to close out the season uh, to be that special team, uh, what would be those three players and what would be their their specific roles? And it could be as surface level as, you know, Oscar Sheboy being Oscar Sheboy or – you know, CJ Frederick being a leader in the locker room or something like that. But just curious what you, what, where your mind went when John Calipari and, and Shin Coleman specifically brought up being the all star in your role and embracing uh, who you are in the rotation. You just want three. Just, so, just whatever comes to your mind. It could be three, it could be more well, or less. I'm, I'm grouping, I'm grouping some together as one because yeah. I think some are a combo. I'm going to group C.J. Frederick and Antonio Reeves into the same grouping. Like, I think that's a pairing. Like, I think Kentucky needs one of those dudes every single night to be knocking down shots. They don't have to have both of them. I think I think those two have the same role, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that is to stretch the floor, not turn it over, and be capable of defending when they're on the floor. Like, that's that's their role, in my opinion, is those, those guys that are shot makers. And, and honestly, I think shot takers because you need those guys taking shots. Um, Oscar Sheboy, I think everybody knows what his role is. I think that he's the the energy. He's the guy that's kind of the nucleus of, the, of this team that dictates – because he's, he's going to clean up so much, Jack, that offensive rebounding, defensive rebounding, uh, he's at the top of everybody's scouting report. Like, we, we know what his role is and kind of the, the heart and soul of this program for the last two years. Um, I think Savir's role right now is honestly, I think probably the most important on the team because he has to stay bought into whatever it is. Mm -hmm. If it's one game where he plays 30 minutes, then he has to be okay with that. If it's one game where he plays 16 minutes, 
he also has to be okay with that. I think he probably has the most complicated role yeah. if anyone on the team because he's playing against a, behind a guy that's going to be an NBA draft pick. And that's just the way the ball bounces sometimes, especially at a place like Kentucky. And I think that if he understands that, then his role goes from the most complicated to probably one of the most solidified because he's the veteran guy that understands it. If this were a freshman, I'd be a little bit more concerned. So I think that Xavier's role would be, I think I would put him as the third one there, just given that I think Kentucky needs him to make a deep run. And if they don't have him, then I think it just puts a ton of stress on Casey Wallace to be that guy every single night out. And those other two that I told you to hit shots, it puts a ton of pressure on your backcourt to be really, really good every single night. So I would go Savir as, as that other role there with those three roles. Man, and and I, I agree and, you know, kind of gave you that so I could give, you know, a couple of different players, maybe not three or four, but, you know, just at least just kind of what what's at the top of my mind right now. I, I thought Cal had some really telling quotes on Wednesday when talking about all this stuff and when breaking down the individual players and all that. He, bring, he brought up Chris Livingston um, yeah. and, and almost like a – we need to be checking egos at the door and stop focusing on four, three, two, one, how you're used, what, you know, what the number is next to your name or the two letters or one letter next to your name, you know, S F P F, you know, C G P G C, you know, stop worrying about that and just understand that, this is a positionless basketball team. We are seeing Jacob Toppin, you know, coming off screens and, you know, getting the ball at the point of attack and, you know, being able to, to have straight line drives to the basket and the dribble drive. Like, you know, he's technically a four, but he's getting used in unique situations as, you know, kind of a unique, versatile wing type. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that that Chris Livingston, there's some talk uh, just kind of about what his role is and, and you know, the fact that Cal specifically singled him out in, in his role and said that they're trying him more at the four and he needs to kind of get over the, uh, you know, the exact number or, or position next to his name. He's a really crucial piece to this team, I think, moving forward. Uh, just, you, you know, whether it means he stops playing a lot or it means he plays a lot more. I, I, he's, he's kind of one of those X factor guys for me that it's like, man, this, this season could go a couple different ways to close things out. And, and I think Chris could be a big part of that one way or the other. Well, and, and you know what I've always said about him, uh, this goes back to the Bahamas or maybe even back to last spring. I think I, I said it on here, me and you both did that. I never wanted to label him anything other than just Chris Livingston, because mm -hmm. I don't think his game necessarily changes, whether it's the three or the four. Mm -hmm. Like matchups are going to be matchups. If Kentucky goes with whatever lineup, if like if him and Jacob are on the floor together, three, four, matchups are still going to be matchups. Like whoever the other team is going to have, they're going to, the guy that's going to be guarding Chris is going to be the guy guarding Chris, whether it's the three or the four. I think it just all depends on, on how Cal uses him. And I like Chris getting downhill and using that body and that frame and that athleticism in transition and just kind of playing bully ball. Like, that's what I like from Chris, that high-energy piece. Like, I think that's when he's at his best. And he had stretches of play there, you know, against UCLA in December where I thought he played very, very well. And I think he could be a significant piece for this team. I mean, he eventually, as the season went along, was has been one of those guys that kind of carved out a role in minutes on this team. And I think that when it gets down to it, there's guys on this team that have higher ceilings than others, and that's the case for every team in college basketball. He's one of those high ceiling guys because of his age and how young he is. Like, he can add a ton to his game, not only the rest of this year, but if he returns next year as a sophomore. But he's one of those guys that hasn't capped yet, in my opinion. Like, we know who Sabir Wheeler is. We know who Oscar Sheboy is. I think those guys have capped. I don't think they can really add much to their game moving forward. Chris, on the other hand, is a guy that could add a ton to his game and still develop over the next six weeks before we get into the NCAA tournament. And I think that's a piece that you want continuing to get better and finding a way to, to play him. And I, if, Cal, if Cal thinks it's the four, it needs to be the four. I think you and I both agree that it should be the four. I hey. thought that all along that should have been where he's played. And I just think it's because uh, – 
there has been pushback on position and how he's used and, and the time he's spent on the floor and, and being put in positions to succeed. There has been pushback with that uh, internally. And it, it, and it, it, like, that's just, that's just a fact. I think there is a very clear opportunity there at that backup four spot alongside and behind Jacob Toppin, where he does play some at the three, but he, but there are those minutes to be had. Damian Collins has not been a guy that has stepped up and, and taken that opportunity. Lance Ware, they try throwing in there at the four every once in a while. They try to play Ugo and, uh, and you know, alongside Oscar Sheboy, that hasn't worked. There are minutes there in that backup where he could com- combine, you know, split, you know, 12 minutes of the three and 12 minutes of the four to play a strong, uh, you know, 25, 30 minutes a, a game. He the, Those minutes are there for the taking for him, but uh, it's like uh, he's not letting himself emerge as that guy and, and you know, oh. use use his talents to his his advantage. And we are running a little bit out of, out of time here, so I do need to kind of wrap up here quickly. But but still, like, that's that's just one thing, one position and one player in particular that I could I think could – could really set this season off. It, just imagine if we go crazy with this basketball Benny lineup and insert Chris at that four and really go all in on on versatility. I mean, really just well, go all in on 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 that. I think that's that's a winning formula. Well, when you were asking me roles earlier to tell me to name three players and I group CJ and Antonio together, I think there's a scenario where you group Jacob and Chris together. And it's a by committee collective thing. It's not necessarily like you get production from your four spot, right? And you can group CJ or you can group uh, Chris's stats into that four role, whether he plays alongside Jacob or not. I think that those two together need to combine for a certain number of points, a certain number of rebounds every single night. The same way CJ and Antonio need to combine for a certain number of made threes, certain number of points, and, and, and things like that, shot attempts, like. That's where I'm saying Kentucky doesn't necessarily have to get its stuff from one guy at these spots. Just maybe you got one person, two people playing the exact same role, whether they play together or they play opposite, and you combine these things. That way you're not looking for somebody to go get 14 points every single night and 11 rebounds. Just get it collectively. Yeah. Well, we are officially out of time. I I want to very quickly give me a, a score prediction and a game MVP for tomorrow. I think this game gets up there in points. I think Kentucky wins it 84 to 81, and I'll go game MVP Oscar Sheboy for all the reasons you said earlier. I think I'm, that this is a matchup where he has a big night. I'm going 79-70 Kentucky, uh, and I think it's going to be Savir. I'm, I'm going to go with Savir very quickly. Where can fans find your work? You can find my work at GoBigBlueCountry.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at GBBCountry. Find me on Twitter as well, at Jack Pilgrim KSR. Reach out to me via email at jpilgrim at KentuckySportsRadio.com. With that, we'll be back after the game. We will see you then.